Welcome. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today, Chaplain Lisa Northway, U.S. Army. Chaplain Lisa, we've been talking about the spiritual warfare, the emotional warfare that actually supersedes in many regards the actual combat that happens on the battlefield for service members and chaplains included. And uh, I'm wondering, are you experiencing anything like that currently? I am. I am. I, there was a situation that, that occurred uh, just about uh, two years ago, and I was at a required course uh, to be able to go to the next level that finishes off a certain level of professional military education. And it's also one that is required not only for promotion, but it's expected at the level I was at as a brigade chaplain. And I had just uh, reported a few months earlier to uh, my brigade chaplain assignment at Fort Hood, Texas, and I was able to get uh, a slot in a that critical class. It's just a two-week course, and I had already done the hard part of what we call intermediate leadership education at a satellite campus, which was truly <laughs> the hardest academic course of my life. I think I... Uh, that you would you uh, it wasn't so much combat that got me in that position, but it, I was literally certainly I was on my knees in a combat situation praying for my soldiers. But at that four month satellite course, I was on my knees every day praying that God would allow me to stay in the class because I quickly discovered I was out of my element, and um, and I've been told that. The chaplain corps, the JAG corps, and the medical corps, those those of us leaders in that, those branches typically struggle a little bit more. We don't have the, uh, the operational experience. That, and very often we know that, that young lieutenants know more than we do uh, because of that's their focus from the beginning of, for regular officers. So not, you know, not the specialized branches per se. So... Uh, so I thought, okay, this two-week course, no big deal. Yeah, I'm excited to come to and get excited to see some of my comrades and chaplains I haven't seen in a while. And uh, two-week course, the requirement, just like in all of our other courses, is uh, you show up, you take the APFD, the Army Physical Fitness Test, and do the height weight. And first, right off the bat, if I pass the uh, APFT the run, you know, two-mile run in uh, with some little, just a little bit of time to spare. And like, okay, here we go. And uh, the morning of the height weigh-in, which was a, a separate morning, or online, and, and and there are some things that you, you just don't think about anymore, even though if you did one time ago, uh, I'm gen very often I am the only female chaplain in the environment. Um, I was certainly the only female uh, chaplain in my class. This is this is not the first time I was at a course at our our branch headquarters where I, I'm the only female. So it, you almost sort of get used to it. And there's also other things. There's some positive things because that's not that's not in itself and in, in, is a bad thing in itself either. But there's some things that are just expectations that go with it. So by the time uh, I was there. I had been a soldier for 31 years. There are certain things that are always in place. Uh, when they have the height weigh in, there's a, a room, uh, a line and a room for the females, and then there's a line and a room for the males. So if your height is went not in your not in the right exact uh, content that it's supposed to be, then you will be also go another room. So you'll be measured to make sure your body fat fits for your height and your age and your gender. And uh, for the first time in my time as 31 years of being a soldier, two kinds of chaos happened. One is uh, the majority of the class, people who, other male chaplains who had never uh, not passed the height part, found themselves in a line. We were all in this, told to be in this line. We would all have to be taped. I would say yes. It was at least half or more 
And I know that that we were in that conversation, that line, we, there was a little disturbance because we all had felt like we were all measured quite a bit shorter than we were. That's certainly shorter than we had. So we knew there's something wasn't right, but we know not to argue with the uh, uh, NCOs that are in, in charge of us. And that's usually not going to end in a, in a helpful place. And I remember hearing uh, some of the chaplains in line with me, some of my friends who said, I've never even been measured before. This is a first, you know, I've never had to. And I'd say, oh, uh, and, and because of the disparity and how it's done, it, we, a lot of people aren't aware that uh, females in the military are actually um, measured on their hips, where just the male soldiers only are measured uh, on their neck and um, right under, at the top of the rib cage. That's a big under difference. The That's a it huge is. difference. <laughs> it is, especially when you think of, if you're only going to tape one gender on the hips, why would you choose the gender that uh, gives birth to babies? Because medical science has told us that uh, it takes 11 years for the hip pelvic area to go back in place, if it ever does at all. And most women have more than one child during those childbirthing years. Yes. So the likelihood that they'll ever go back, not real, not real <laughs> high. I think there's a few blessed uh, soldier sisters out there <laughs> who have that in the civilian world and also in the military, and I'm really glad for them. <laughs> yes. I'm quite sure I'm not one of those people. But um, so, uh, so the only reason I did not know that, though, for my first 31 years of being a soldier. I've been a soldier now for um, 33 and a half years. And uh, it was because of this experience that followed, and following the, the height portion, that I found out. Uh, I, first, I was asked, uh, a female NCO came out of the room, and she knew who I was going to be next. And I was asked a question. At 6 in the morning, you're not aware you're necessarily being Asked, being asked a question for the first time in your career as a soldier. Uh, we're usually starving on purpose a little bit. We're getting, <laughs> yes. We know that. Okay, let's be a little lean that night before, you know, those little things like that. But knowing that I overall generally you know, always passed, I'm still in the military after these years. We know we know what it takes to make yes, sure that, you do. that what it takes to pass, pass that exam. And the question I was asked was, Chapel Northway, do you need a same gender tape team? I never kind of kind of blankly thinking um, and looking at this long line of males, and basically she's telling me in so many, you know, in the nonverbal, because the nonverbal is speaking louder in the way I'm being asked, like, are we gonna have to go figure something out? And she's asking me as a trainee what. Uh, if so they getting... don't have it for you. Right, basically. Okay. And I said, uh, well, and, you know, and your peers are standing there. And I never really thought of myself as being somebody who maybe would bow to peer pressure. I didn't really see it that way. I was just like, gosh darn it, I've been a soldier for 30 years. Let's just kind of in, this, in my mindset, let's just do this. And that was the wrong answer. If they're asking me, a chaplain and an officer, that question I've also come to realize they're probably not going to ask the private female or the private male recruit. They're just going to do it. And, and that's why we need to have people who have voices to stand up. And in that moment, I've, the, what I've struggled with is, is that I think I, I've had to take some personal responsibility for adopting a minority complex. In that moment, there were no other female trainees in that line. And I, and in, in the hunger and the zero, I can blame it on the zero six hundred, zero dark thirty or whatever. It's probably zero four thirty. I think that morning, uh, in that time frame, that I can blame it on that. But what I have to grapple with was, I didn't ask for what I needed, and what I know I truly want, and what had always been provided for me in thirty one years of being a soldier. And that's the very thing I teach my soldiers: ask for what you need, and some things that you want. So at least you don't have the regret that you didn't ask. You know, you don't either. You can't look backwards and say, "Well, I did ask." You know, at least. And so, uh, went into that space, um, and, it, and a lot of firsts are happening. They're they're happening not just for me. They're happening for the males too. 
But in that, the shock and awe, the first going on, and and seeing that when you walk into that room, there are two other men. At that point, they're not touching me, but there there were two females. But then they had two they had two uh, male observers, and I'm being told to lift my top in front of men. And and again, in in the hunger <laughs> and the you know the. Just all, everything's just happening really fast. It's sounding very disorienting. Yes, it, it, I think it was. And, um, you know, I don't think I had, I, I can tell you for certain, the specialist, uh, the E4 in me, the young soldier, the private that I was way back in the day, would have been absolutely mortified yes. to lift up. And I think there's something about when you're over 50 and you're you've had a child. It's like, ah, battle scars, no big deal. Again, that's not the right answer because if we're being asked that, we have to consider who's not going to be asked. Very good point. Because I have the privilege of being an officer and a chaplain, and I need to understand I'm not just answering for myself. I may be answering for my whole gender at that same institution or. Somewhere yes. else, I'm like, well, there's precedence yes. here. We're creating precedence, but the precedence in my mind, and even that I, my whole experience as a soldier, not just as a chaplain, as a soldier, was that I could always expect that there would be a separate line for the the females and the males in a separate room, just as there were as there was um, a year before that when I was at my ILE satellite course. And when we did the APFT, pass it, go in, you know, if you have to be tight. And, and it's only women in there. And there's something about that. You, I mean, just there's a natural thing. I mean, certainly it could be for some people if they've experienced same gender abuse, they could, that could still be uncomfortable. There's nothing like really glorious or wonderful anyway about, no, about that kind of situation, <laughs> you know. Um, so... Um, at the end of that session, though, and I and, and and a lot of us were were very concerned because we were we were up to an inch shorter than what we normally are. So we knew this there was a, already a problem, but we're probably still trying to recover the fact like they just quoted us a whole inch shorter, like for the most of the class. Yeah. And so I'm in that space, and I'm just trying to get through it. And then I remember them saying, um, "Chapel Northway, you're you're over body fat." I'm like, oh. And but I realized, and they said, "Well." We'll, we'll tape you again in seven days. And and, I, and in my mind, because I've, you know, I've always gotten through it, you know, that, okay, yeah, that's such a small percentage. I'll, I'll come back and knock that out. So there was two of us that had to come back. But it's interesting to me that, that uh, before we got to that seventh day, uh, I was later that day in the classroom, one of our class leaders said, uh, came to me, probably says, Chapman North, I want to come to you first because you're the only female in the class. But I'd like to have an open discussion because we're definitely of the of the mindset that this was an irregular height weight. And I said, okay, sure, I have no problem with that. So he opened it up and everybody nodded their heads and said, yes, this was a problematic height weight. They were, for the most part, relieved because there was only two of us that appear, appeared it could be potentially punitive to. But we knew we had a week. You know, to get it together, you know, to, to to clarify that discrepancy. And I think we were both we were both confident that, yeah, that's something that was doable. So we didn't really, you know, fight the fight the fight about the fact that the inches were all off for, for all of us. And um, so seven days later, again, uh, the, the two of us, uh, another male chaplain and myself, we, we go and they do the height again, and again, it's like, oh my goodness, how can, how could I just be suddenly that short? And I knew I just had my height weight done at home station, and uh, and you can think of maybe some of the perfect storms. I certainly we've been preparing for the ACFT, and I had a compression injury that was working working through, and like, well, maybe that's that. But okay, I. I I've done some diligence this last week. I, everything should be okay. And so we get in that room, and I was asked again, just before I go in the room and say, Chapa Northway, do you really need a same gender or all female mm. tape team? And again, I'm like, why am I being asked this again? You know, but again, I'm just like, you're you know, starving again, and you're looking around, and there's not a female in that building anywhere. And there's only one female asking me the situation, and it's the first sergeant. And so, and that's pretty authoritative. Like, well, gosh, 
first sergeant's asking me this, so um, this there seems to be a, a hardship or something here. Um, so I said, well, let's just go ahead, do this again. The wrong answer for me, because I'm not asking for what I truly needed, what I have always had in 31 years of being a soldier. Which is women measuring you. Right, right. Because there is something, I think it, the way we stand, the way we breathe, when we realize that a men are looking at you and you're partially exposed. That That's... It's uncomfortable. Yes. I, I, because it's not about, you know, like, you know, say, well, what if, what if you wear a swimsuit on the beach? It's like, well, these are men, some who, uh, in a small corps that I work with, you know, I, my husband's not here. I'm in the presence of other yeah, people. It's inappropriate. And, and, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, and it just, you know, when you look back, you know, it's kind of, kind of those hindsight things. And you think, there's just something that was just so wrong about that. And I remember the same person on that second taping who had um, done the height weight both times before, he was also asked to come into that room and uh, and verify the, the location where the first sergeant was setting the tape. And and he seemed really nervous, so it made me think, okay, this is the same person who did our height wrong, as far as we know. There was a consensus, but we can't really, we're not in a position as trainees, we can argue that. But then... Um, now he's really nervous, and it appears to not ever have done, at least taped a woman before. He may have done a height weight before, but he's, there's something about that, and everything that just feels, you just get a sense, and again, you're trying to <laughs> hold in your stomach and be your smallest person uh, for something that your career absolutely depends on. Because the consequence is, if you don't pass the second one, you're automatically sent home. Oh, my goodness. It didn't matter that we were two days, a day and a half from graduation, had a 92% in the class. Um, and at the conclusion of that, I was still chopping north way, you are, you are 1% over One. body oh, fat. Word. And that was absolute devastation. And I, I remember my senior instructor turning to the first sergeant and saying, because he, I think he had heard of the scuttle about the, I think this first sergeant, would you mind just doing Chapman Northway's height just one more time. He's not asking for a full height weight. Again, just, can you just verify our height? And um, and so she says, oh, sure, Chapman, we can do that. And so she takes me over and she has the, the sergeant first class who had done it the other two times for the whole class. And she watches him put me on the scale and she sees him measure me. And then she turns to me and she says, Chapman Northway, could you please get off the scale? It was very, you know, fervent. And I said, yes, first sergeant. And I got off the side. She turns to the sergeant first class as an on-spot correction and says, did you not know that you were supposed to roll up on the height part of the height weight? And I remember him just stammering. There was no affirmative answer whatsoever that, oh, I forgot, or yeah, I, I, I know I'm supposed to do that. I don't know why I forgot that time kind of thing. And um, it was like kind of a no answer, kind of a kind of a stammering, and she and she said, "Let's do this again." So she says, "Get back up on there, chatting with me." I said, "Yes, yes, for sergeant." And uh, sergeant first class says again. Now she says, "Okay, now we're gonna roll up properly," and he does it, and I am taller, and that helps a little bit, but not quite enough. And so um, the the required process is for my instructor to provide me paperwork to dismiss me from the course. What was really tough about that is that it was just two months before, November, three months before my uh, primary zone, the first true look at, at the board to be promoted, which, and it, typically in the military, if you you are not promoted on time, and then you'll get one more chance, which is even harder to look at. For most officers, you're automatically um, chaptered out of the military in six months. And um, and so I w he gave me the paperwork in the same breath. The senior instructor said, Chaplain Northway, you need to know now, because of this dismissal, you will not be promoted in the primary zone. Oh, my. And, you know, just the the reality of that washing over me. And I said, okay, 
thank you for telling me. And it was so hard because I had just finished that hardest course, like I said, in my whole military career, that four months and that victory. And I think it was just this, this thing. And I just, there was so much about it, though, that just didn't seem right. And, uh, and I actually had another person on staff at the Chapman School say, I really think you need to call your home uh, company commander because didn't you have a one before you came? I said, yeah, I yeah, passed it and everything. And um, he said, I just encourage you to just to see I, there's some things that I, I keep seeing anomalies here that, that are happening for some of the courses. And it's not just you, but we, we keep seeing some problematic things where we're bringing people out here. We're, uh, and I think we're, we're, our best practices are not being fully engaged. I said, okay. You know, I wasn't looking for for really anything at that point. You know, my only at that point, I was just thinking, gosh, I really, um, I really needed a same gender take team. I really felt for me that would have made the difference mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of how nervous I was at realizing that men were looking at my partially yeah, exposed sure. body, and where I had to lift the sh- lift my mm-hmm. shirt up in their presence, and. Um, so uh, I called my company commander. He happens to be with my command sergeant major. She gets on the phone and she said, Chapel Northway, what's going on? And, and I said, oh, sergeant major, I'm coming home. I, I was just dismissed from the course. And she says, what? What's going on? Tell me what happened. And so I told her and she said, Chapel Northway, it's Fort Jackson. The NCO Academy was there. All they had to do was walk across and ask for a couple of female NCOs to, to do this oh, thing. Like, you know, why I don't understand why that wasn't provided for you. And um, she said, you are not coming home until you've been to the commandant. I mean, she literally ordered me. And I'm like, oh, gosh, this is not what I want to do. And so I went back to my instructor. I said, hey, uh, my command sergeant major, she's tracking, and she's ordered me to go to the commandant. He says, hey. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Do what you need to do. And I said, all right. So I went, and I uh, I knew of him. I'd met him before, before he was a commandant, in small corps. And he said, uh, Chapman Northway, what can I do for you? And I said, sir, I said, I'm, I'm here to ask for a third height weight, but this time, for a first time. So it would be just like I've always had it as a soldier, um, uh, an all-female height weight team that's just always been provided. And he said... Um, let me find out what's going on. I'm going to go across the bridge uh, to the cadre. I'll come back in a few minutes and I'll, I hope to have an answer for you. And I said, yes, sir, thank you. So I, I waited. He came back and put me back in his office. And he said, Chapman Northway, I'm sorry, I, I've got bad news. And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, I just found out the first sergeant, she didn't actually have an all trained, uh, fully trained, oh. same gender height weight team to give you. Oh. And I said, sir, are you telling me if I had said yes, either or both of the times it was offered, she would not have been able to provide it? And he just hung his head. He didn't answer. He just hung his head. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, we're professionals. We're two officers. We're two chaplains. We've always been told if we ever offer something we cannot provide, we could get counseled. We could get reprimanded. We just don't do that. And I was devastating. And uh, he, I see him get, he gets up, he walks over to his um, side desk, he opens a drawer, and I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in the, you know, in the, the, the most unimaginable time I didn't see coming you know, in my career. And um, and he's fiddling with some drawer. So he opens the drawer and he comes, walks over. He stands over me. I'm sitting in the same chair. And he leans over and he holds out his hand and it's got a coin in it. And he says, Chapa Northway, this is my coin. It's usually reserved for excellence. I'm putting it in your hands for the hope of future excellence when you return. At some point. Wow. Although that didn't fix your dilemma. No. And it didn't bring justice. No. It didn't right the wrong. They say that, I've been told that there's only one chaplain 
in the U.S. Army who has command authority, and that is the commandant. So he, uh, he had the capacity uh, to do it. And uh, I'm not a full expert, but I have wondered often about that. Could that have been fixed? And certainly as I walked away from that, and I had... I had many people who breathe in the situation, and uh, some people who don't know yet where the status is. Um, they knew that I was working it. I was very encouraged, even on the sidewalk that day. Um, I ran into the deputy chief at Chaplains, who I had had some great experiences with uh, in when I was part of USERPAC. and he heard of my situation. He said, "Chaplain, I never give up. Don't don't stop. Don't stop working this." Um, and I've done that. I don't, that's Is that what you're word. doing now? That's what I'm doing now. So what are your options? So um, there's, we've had a couple of times where we've sent it in. We sent it to the director of training. They said, oh, well, we can't do anything about that. Referred AER that's in your file. And I didn't actually know until I went into my above the zone this year. And I just the night before I signed, I said, oh, my goodness. The referred AER, are there, AER academic evaluation report, is still on there, even though I did go back and complete the class and got a 98 instead of a 92. And uh, I was thinking erroneously <laughs> that, I guess, that that was going to be removed from my board file uh, once I replaced it. It's still there. I'd also been told since then that I also, what I what happened at the first, at this first course, I actually received an erroneous height weight that um, the, the uh, Army is not allowed to take punitive action to dismiss you from a course, something like that, unless they use a completely different height weight team. And it would have been okay, the, the outcome. I would have to, you know, should expect to live with that if they had used two completely different teams. But it was the same signatures, at least two of the three or so were the same people. And I, and I certainly have all that documentation. That documentation has been, you know, trying to work uh, the issue at the lowest level possible, like my mentors have, have suggested, um, has not led to uh, uh, a positive outcome. Uh, I have had people say that it, it does need to be presented on a higher level. So I'm in that situation where I um, continue to deal with it at the lowest level but now be presented and get representation, at least in the Army, if not, hopefully not outside the Army. Is, is the first uh, time. You mentioned as we, as you were beginning to share the story and the event that happened, you mentioned that you should have spoken up for your gender to help set the precedent. So as you fight this battle, you're fighting just for you? No. In fact, someone said to me, uh, yeah, there was definitely genders involved in it, but really it's about both genders, that both men and women deserve to be able to have the same gender height weight. Too. Very good. It's not just about females. I mean, right. can imagine being a male and never being, having to expose part of your body yes. to a female. Yes. And we, many of us, we're the most cross-cultural population on the face of the American military, more than even other militaries, I think. And we have these sensitivities that they've been given room for. In the yes. military, we have a religious accommodations. We have all kinds of things. And in fact, my endorser since then said, "If this, if you were ever in this situation again, please stop what you're doing. I will give you a religious accommodation for modesty. Oh wow! If nothing sure, else, sure, sure. And I didn't, you know, I, did, I didn't know to ask because I never was in that situation. We situation to need it. The um, the amazing news, and this is really why I tell the story. And then, as we talked about, um, the difference." that God makes when it's important not to believe what you see in front of you. And I pray this with my soldiers and the family members, that beyond a legal report, beyond a medical report, beyond an academic evaluation report, is a God in Jesus Christ who is truly the Alpha and Omega over each of our situations. No other person, entity, organization, no one gets that right or privilege outside of him over each of our situations and our lives and our livelihood. And so even though I have this situation, I'm looking forward to an outcome. I hope to be able to give you a sequel that I've hoped and many people have prayed with me for in the meantime. And we know God works with us in our meantime, as he does in all 
throughout history. And, and um, that word meantime is in the book of Genesis, speaking of Joseph. In the meantime, there was always Amen. that God was at work. Well, it looked like there was no hope. Well, it looked like I was being left for dead by my brothers in a pit while I was sold into slavery, while I was r maybe wrongly accused of uh, taking advantage of Pharaoh's wife, while my brothers were arguing. In the meantime, God was doing something. And he says, you know, what God, uh, what you or somebody, an enemy may have meant for evil, God meant for good. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And that indeed is a difference in that God makes is that you have hope because he's greater than all these things. Absolutely. And I, I have lived to see that even in the unknown, even in the meanwhile, this year as uh, what we prayed for was that really what I've always wanted wasn't always about being promoted on time or any time. It was about being able to continue to answer the call. Yes. Uh, to be able to do and be what gives me the greatest joy in Jesus Christ, this side of eternity, to be a chaplain, to be with those who are away from home for the first time, in transition, doing hard things. And uh, this year, and even though I, you know I just said that I had signed that board file, realizing, oh my gosh, there's a paper in there that is so unhelpful that anybody would say there's nothing could good, good can come from that because that uh, it wasn't replaced by the good report. Yes. Uh, the the board met. Uh, I was turns out I was passed over a second time, and this certainly I am experiencing some deep spiritual meaning with the words, the second Passover. We know that Jesus, oh goodness, is the second Passover. Yes, and uh, the next, the, the what happens in the military boards? They'll finish meeting, and if they have a, they'll they'll sometimes in the chapel court they'll have a second board that meets after that's. Process over, completely standalone as far as the purpose. It might be the same people, but they meet to find, to discover, is there anybody who was passed over on that list that would be worthy of continuing to be selected to continue indefinitely as at that rank, being eternal from, in this case, an eternal major. Yes. That's my current rank. And I prayed that I would be able to, two things, I'd be able to continue to do what I absolutely love for as long as I could. Uh, for as long as the army would allow, and that I would get to be co-located with my husband, because certainly there's been some geographical uh, separation during some of the deployments, some of the missions, and we knew we wanted to be able to, as much as possible, life is short, no guarantees, as we all know, we signed up for that, and to have that. So I found out, it, was, it takes a few months for that board to be released, definitely found out what we thought, there's, yeah, there's, that promotion was not going to happen. Uh, it's the statistics go down with each each board that uh, if you've missed your primary zone that you could get promoted, even though your name does continue once you're as long as the army to stay in that that uh, group. Uh, I got uh, something. Uh, the first official news that I found out came through uh, Human Resources Command, stating, uh, "We regret to inform you that you were." Uh, not selected to be promoted to lieutenant colonel. In addition, you have been selected to continue as a major. And that oh. was what I was waiting for. But then I looked at the paper and I, I thought, surely, surely this must be a typo. <laughs> it said, because um, everybody knows that your mandatory age retirement is 62. And so that would, at this point, give me three more years. Uh, which I would be absolutely thankful for. It said, but it said, it took me out to the year 2026, which <gasps> that would put me out to 64. And I remember asking around and, well, people, you might want to check that out. And I, I called my assignments officer and I said, sir, um, is it a typo or does the year, is that year correct that I, it potentially takes me to the age of 64? And he says, yes, chaplain, that's correct. Uh, you will have to ask for a waiver at age 61 uh, to see to good, stay beyond 62. But yes, you have the possibility of everything, all things being equal, kind of everything is okay. You're still, you know, making all the other benchmarks you need to make. Um, you could potentially be here at 64. I said, sir, are you saying that I potentially am going to be here? I could be here longer than some of the people who have been promoted to lieutenant colonel and colonel. He says, 
Oh, yes, Chapa Northway. That is exactly what it means. Oh, my word. God answered your most important prayer. Not the promotion, but that you get to serve your soldiers. Yes. I'm so excited. <laughs> That's <laughs> so amazing. Thank you, Chaplain Lisa. <laughs> Thank we'll you. continue next time. Thank you.